Good morning, church. As George said, the book of Jude, the letter of Jude, is where we're going to be uh, this morning finishing up. <clears throat> With that this morning, so good to see you. I, um, one, one of the things that drives me crazy, and uh, there are quite a list of things that drive me crazy, as I'm sure you have your own list of things that would drive you crazy. Um, maybe, maybe you would even agree with this one, but um, it's, it's other people looking at their phone while they're driving. That drive. See, now that's uncomfortable laughter because some of you are like, yeah, I agree with him, and some of you are like, I do that. And uh, you shouldn't. You shouldn't do that. Um, th- because the problem with distracted driving, looking at your phone while you're driving, is that by not looking at the road, you're creating a dangerous situation for uh, pedestrians, for other motorists, and for yourself and for the passengers that are in uh, your vehicle. I've seen studies, read studies that say that uh, distracted driving is as bad as uh, driving drunk, uh, being impaired behind the wheel because you're, you're just not looking. And that's really the, the principle behind the reason why we don't do this. I'm almost done the pu- public service announcement part of this sermon, by the way, almost done. But the reason why we don't do that is because we cannot simultaneously watch the road and look at the text message that just came in. You can't do both of those things and your eyes need to be on the road. Now, that's just good advice on its face. You can take that and walk away and say, I learned something today. I shouldn't look at my phone while I'm driving. But of course, we have a greater need this morning to look into God's word. And that relates to this final message in the book of Jude and indeed uh, the entirety of this letter as we've looked at it over the past five messages. Jude's concern in this letter is that his, his readers have been distracted by false teaching, by false teachers who have come into the church that have threatened to draw them away from the life-giving message of the gospel uh, and, 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 and really to distort the truth, to twist it into something that is not the gospel. <clears throat> and his appeal to them, and this was in the very first message in verse 3, his appeal to them was to contend for the faith, uh, to fight for the faith, to wrestle down what they believe about the gospel and to believe these things that have been handed down to them from the apostles themselves. And that's a lifelong thing for us. That's not just something we, you know, I wrestled down the gospel and I became a Christian. Like we've already said in this series that the wrestling down of the gospel, applying it to our lives, working it out uh, in, our, in our day-to-day lives as Christians, that's a lifelong thing. I'm, I'm daily and for the rest of my life until I see Jesus, I'm wrestling with the word of God. I'm wrestling with God himself. I'm, I'm, I'm working through all of these truths that I'm lear- learning. Uh, in God's word and seeking to grow in them. Well, in these closing verses of of the letter, Jude offers what is a doxology. Now, a doxology is a short hymn, a song or a poem praising God. It is sung or said as part of a Christian church service or a liturgy of a church. That's from Cambridge Dictionary. Uh, The word doxology, is is, its origins are in the Greek. The word doxa, from the Greek means a manifestation or a revealing of power uh, characterized by glory, which causes wonder and amazement. So a doxology has us singing or saying in a more formal way how awesome and glorious God is. And by its nature, because we're doing that, we're just singing about how awesome God is. We're just talking about how awesome God is. Uh, Because of the nature of it, when you're doing that, it removes all other distractions. A doxology is is an exhortation for us to go vertical with God. And when we go vertical with God, of course, we're uh, putting the horizontal world in its proper place. We're getting our eyes off of the horizontal. And the reason why that's hard and the reason why we need to contend to do this is because we live in the horizontal world and it's not natural for us to be vertical and to look to the Lord. It's more natural for us to have our eyes on our life and on our circumstances. A doxology brings us back to the vertical, removing distractions, putting our attention where it belongs on the Lord himself. Now, as it relates to Jude's concern and this whole idea of deconstruction of our faith, which we've been talking about for these five weeks, 
we get our eyes off of, we get our eyes off of self-centered, human-engineered religion and all the distortions of the pure gospel of Christ, we do that by gazing at the wonder and the splendor of our God. Again, that's the point of the doxology. And that's what you and I need to build our lives on. And that's what we're going to see again in these last two verses. So let me read these for us. We're going to start working through this. We're going to do what the author of Hebrews said. We're going to, Hebrews 12 too, we're going to fix our eyes on Jesus as we do this. So here's the doxology, verses 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory and majesty and dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. 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 All right, here's how we're going to go about this. Look at the first word. Just look at the very first word of verse 24. It's the word now. And it's a transition word. It's, he's shifting gears here from his whole argument of his book into something New In some of your translations, you may even see the word but there, and it's like a but now. Now, in light of everything else that I've said, here's where we need to go. Here's the answer. Here's the solution to this problem of false teachers distorting the gospel. So here it is in your notes and on the screen. When I build my life on Jesus, when I build my life on Jesus, back in verse 20, he had, he had said to us, we need to be building yourself up, building ourselves up in our most holy faith. And so we're using that language to talk about building up this spiritual house that we live in. When I build up, build my life on Jesus, I have certain God-given traits or characteristics. And the first one of the, is this, I have present confidence. I have present confidence. I'm confident now in, in life. And I'm, I'm, this is really me saying, I'm, I'm sure of God no matter what, no matter what my circumstances, no matter what happens, no matter what other people are chirping in my ears, I have confidence in God. I'm not confident in myself, but in the Lord. Now to him, now to him, to God, not to me, to him, who is able, notice, to keep you from stumbling. Now think about that. In my Christian life, like I can look back and go like, I feel like I stumbled there. I feel like I tripped over this. I feel like I was lying flat on my face at this point in my life. Lots of stumbling, lots of tripping, lots of just kind of scraping by to kind of make progress in the Christian life. And yet here Jude is saying in this doxology, it is possible that we not stumble over the doctrines of Christ, over the gospel itself. It's possible or else it wouldn't be here in the doxology because it's not dependent on us. It's dependent on God himself keeping us from stumbling, keep us from falling, to stay with the metaphor, to keep us from falling for the false teaching and by implication falling into sin. In other words, I'm gonna trust the Holy Spirit to keep me upright. I'm gonna trust the Holy Spirit to keep me on the right road. I'm gonna trust the Holy Spirit to make me sure-footed in my walk with Christ. Now, as an aside, if, if we kind of just kind of go into a little parenthesis right now and, and just say, and this is something I've said already in the series, maybe a couple of times, but we've learned in Jude that the primary concern is not for the world's teaching. We understand that the teaching outside of the church is anti-gospel. We get that. And Jude's concern is not for that. Jude's concern is for what's going on inside of the church. His concern is for false teachers who have crept into the church itself. And that can happen in any given local church. That could happen here where teachers creep in and, and maybe uh, teaching a small group or maybe in one-on-one -on -one conversations and they're not quite aligning with the gospel and they're trying to divert people away. I got an email this week from a guy who visited a couple weeks ago. He is clearly not on our path. And in his first email, he was kind of baiting me and he asked a question and I graciously answered the question. And in the, in the, in the, in the email response back, I was attacked. Okay, he's a false teacher. He's, he's coming in here to subvert. He's, he's coming in here to distort the gospel. And, and so that can happen here, but it can also happen globally because we're so wired now, we can hear preachers from all over the world. 
We can go online, we go on YouTube, we can go to their websites, we can see it on Facebook and, and Twitter. We get all this content coming at us constantly. We can go seeking it or it can just come to us. And that's the broader global church. And these teachers can subvert and undermine the gospel. So I think Jude has both in view here, false teachers in the church, both locally and globally, who intentionally and cleverly distort the gospel for their own purposes, and as Jude has indicated, often for personal gain. I think one of the greatest tests for a false teacher, for someone who's, who's purporting to, to proclaim the gospel, but if they are getting very wealthy off the gospel, I have some suspicions about that. I think we ought to ask some questions about the gospel that they're preaching. And so, they're cleverly distorting, it's often for personal gain, the greatest danger is with those who are familiar to us, those who are using the same words that we're using, but with different definitions, those who subtly undermine what we believe and may cause us to stumble in any number of, of key areas of doctrine, of, of teaching of the Bible. For example, questioning the authority of, of the word, and we're gonna talk more about authority in a few minutes, but questioning the authority of the word twisting our understanding of the Trinity. There are a number of, of, of preachers out there who would tell you that they align with us, but they distort the understanding of the Trinity. Distort an understanding of how a person is saved and the nature of salvation. The nature of Jesus as being fully God and fully man, as well as the biblical understanding of humanity itself, that we are one with God in Christ, but we are not God. We all understand that, right? We are one with God in Christ, but we are not God. We are not as some would teach. We are not a little God. We, 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 are, we are not, we are saved. We are saved by the I am, but we are not the I am. When I build my life on Jesus, listen, I'm gonna not stumble over these things because I'm building my life on Jesus. My confidence is gonna be 100% in him and not in me. I'm not kept by my own intellect. I'm not kept by my own effort. I'm not kept by my own devotion. I am kept in the very same way that I was saved. Ephesians 2, 8, that we are saved by grace through faith. That's the way I was saved, but that is also the way I'm kept. I'm kept by grace through faith. And that comes because of Jesus and my confidence is in him, not in myself, and not in anyone else. Here's a second trait. It is uh, that I have a future hope, a future hope. Now, continuing the metaphor, but you can't quite see it here in the ESV, if you, if you have an ESV in front of you and what I teach from, he, he says, and to present you, to present you, but the, literally that means to make you stand which again is consistent with this stumbling. Now instead of stumbling, he's making us stand. And the Christian Standard Bible, New American Standard Bible, both have stand there rather than present you to make you stand before God at the judgment as, notice the word, blameless. Blameless. Perfect. I mean, he's talking about you and me here. If we're professing Christians, imagine this. Imagine, imagine being perfect. I mean, some of you here this morning are so aware of your own sinfulness. You have no trouble confessing that. Some of you think, I'm doing okay. I'm, I'm less sinful, maybe. And, and you think really uh, a lot of yourself in that regard. Maybe it's because you've been a Christian for a long time. And I would just encourage you, talk to your spouse, your parents, your children, someone close to you. They will remind you. They will remind you that you are a sinner, that you are imperfect, that you have uh, plenty that you could be blamed uh, for uh, in this life, but imagine the moment, imagine it, when you are actually blameless, that, that you will stand before God, blameless and perfect, faultless, without spot at all, without blemish of any kind, fully cleared, imagine the moment when you are fully cleared of all sin, and able to come, as the verse says here, as the doxology continues, before the presence of his doxa, his glory. This is only possible because of what Peter called the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb, 
without blemish or spot. In fact, it was Jesus' perfect sacrifice that cleansed us of our sin and made us a blameless. I just want you to imagine what it would be like to be so free of sin, so free of the debt of sin, that you can stand before Jesus, so, so perfect that you can be in front of and taking in his doxa, his glory. It's something that, that Moses wanted to experience while he was still in this earthly life. Moses, of course, had this special relationship with God, a face-to-face -face one. They spoke as man-to-man. -man. Um, commentators agree that, that Moses was talking to a pre-incarnate appearing of Jesus, that Moses was sitting across from Jesus in these conversations. And in the course of these conversations up on Mount Horeb, he, 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 asked, he asked if he could see the glory of God. He said in Exodus 33, 18, show me your glory. But God let him know that you cannot, this is in verse 20, he says, you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. In other words, if you see the glory of God in its full expression right now, you will be vaporized. And the reason for that, because we have it in our mind, well, this is exactly what God wants. God wants to bring us into his glory. Isn't that the thing? That we're gonna be with Jesus forever, that we're gonna see him face to face. That is the thing that we're heading toward as Christians. But the reality is right now, as we continue to have sin in our life, that we can't see God's face the glory would consume us. God is perfectly holy. And human beings are sinful, you and me included. God had told him just prior to this little exchange that Moses and the people would in fact see glimpses of his glory and things like his goodness and his grace being poured out in Israel and, and his mercy being dem demonstrated to the people. But he also made it clear that they weren't ready to see the full expression of that. They weren't ready to see his face. In his kindness, in fact, God makes an arrangement for Moses to see just a, a passing glimpse of his glory. In, in, in the text, it says that, I'll, I'll let you see my back after I pass by. And he hides Moses and he passes by and Moses comes out and takes just, a, just, a, just sees a passing glance of the back of God, the back of the glory of God. And having experienced that, he, he came down off the mountain back to the people. And when he came down, the people were terrified. And they said they were so afraid. This is in um, 34, Exodus 34, 30. The skin of his face shone and the people were afraid to come near him. And so what did Moses do? Exodus 34, uh, 33 says that he put a veil over his face so that when he talked to the people, they wouldn't see the glory of God on his face and they wouldn't be terrified by it. Now, I want you to put a, a little bookmark for a second in, that, in the idea of Moses putting a veil over his face because we're gonna come back to that. And all I'm trying to do here with the, with the recounting of the Moses story from Exodus 33 and 34 is this. I'm, I'm simply giving you a picture of the glory of God and what it's like to be in his presence because it speaks to our hope. Our hope is we're gonna see his glory and we're gonna see the full expression of his glory. And that's awesome to think about. It's overwhelming to even think about. But here's how it happens. Romans 8, 30 says, and those whom he predestined, if he predestined you to salvation, he also called. And those whom he called to salvation, he also justified or saved. And those whom he saved or justified, he also glorified. So we're gonna to get to that place where we too are in glorified, perfected, blameless, perfect bodies. The, tra the trajectory of our life okay, as Christians, from the moment of our salvation and through this, this choppy thing we call our walk with Christ, this process of becoming more and more sanctified, more and more holy, growing in Christ, the trajectory of that is that ultimately when I see Christ, I will be perfectly glorified in him. Or as Romans 8, 17 says, we will share in his glory. Then Paul kind of ties all of this uh, together in another letter to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 3.18, he says this, and we all 
And here's where that bookmark comes back into place. And we all, notice, with unveiled face, Moses had to veil his face so people wouldn't see the glory of God. We now, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed. So that's kind of the ultimate, that's the hope. But the process are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For for this comes from the Lord who is spirit. And there's a sense in which the longer I walk with Christ in this life, I'm moving closer and closer to his glory even now. It's not like it's entirely an end time future when I die, when I see Christ's fulfillment of hope. That hope is being fulfilled little by little. That glory is being increased in me little by little as I continue to walk with him. I'm reflecting it more and more as I'm transformed adding, as Paul says here, I'm adding degrees of glory with every step I take with Christ. A Jackie Hill Perry has written a wonderful book called Holier Than Thou. And uh, she, says, she says this, a lasting transformation is a spiritual consequence of beholding the glory of the Lord. That's the process we just talked about. And she references the same verse. That's why we're here, to behold, to set our sights on a higher love, to see who Adam hid from, who the psalmist sang to, who the prophets spoke for, who the disciples walked with, and who Jesus made known. Isn't that beautiful? Our glory, that's our hope. Our glory is our hope. Here's a third trait, unending joy, unending joy. Doesn't that sound good? Wouldn't you just like to be in a place of unending joy, unending happiness? We're going to come into his presence, according to this doxology, with great joy, not Fleeting happiness, and I'm not going to say, oh, happiness bad, joy good, Christians joy, the world happy. I'm not going to say that. It's awesome also to be happy. It's good to be happy. And there are things in our lives that bring us happiness, and that's okay. We're trying to reach for this deep-seated joy that isn't based, though, on circumstances, but something that comes deep from our hearts. The word joy, in fact, one lexicon says that it is intensive gladness expressed in, in very physical ways. So I have such a joy inside of me. It's, in, it's so intense that it manifests itself in outward exuberance. Words I speak, um, emotions that I make, it could be dancing, it could be leaping or jumping. It just flows out from me. And when you understand this definition we've used before, joy is supernatural delight in the plans, purposes, and people of God. It's not, see, this is the the difference between, happiness seems to be just kind of circumstantially related, but this is supernatural. This is something that comes from God directly, and it can't be taken from us. It's not of human origin. It beats anything we can manufacture and experience in this life. I mean, think about all the things that make you happy and that might bring you some measure even of, of temporary joy in your life. Think about that. What makes you happy? Your family? Sometimes. Sometimes not. But sometimes your family just brings you joy. And that's just, you just love those times when you're just together. Your wedding hopefully brought you happiness and joy. The arrival of a child, a baby into your home, some success, some accomplishment that you achieved, winning something, you know, winning like some championship in, in sports or some competition that you're a part of and you took the trophy, you took the ribbon and it brought some joy, some happiness to you. That's great. No judgment on this, but if you buy lottery tickets and you win the lottery, that's gonna bring you a little hit. And hopefully you remember to tithe. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I'll take it. I'll take it. Getting a job you love. Graduating. All the work is behind you. You walk the platform. You get the paper. You move the tassel. 
best, your best friendship is awesome. And such joy and happiness that can come when you're just with someone you're so comfortable with. Or for men, really great barbecue. <laughs> Last week I was in Texas with my friend Tony and he invited me down to speak at a men's retreat and at his church. And uh, they got a good thing going on down there. It was a pleasure to be down there. And uh, I got to see some Texas things down in San Antonio. And, and then, um, but he, he worked me hard, like from Friday evening until a Sunday morning, I preached five times. Okay, I preached five times. And I was exhausted, but the reward was barbecue, Texas barbecue. <laughs> and I want to tell you that in this moment, can we just move to the close up? Oh. <laughs> I was so tired, but in this moment, so happy. <laughs> and, and, and Texas does barbecue like no one else. I'm telling you, the, the bark on that meat was absolutely astounding. The meat was juicy. It was flavorful. It was amazing. <laughs> I mean, it was just seven days ago, and I can still taste it. I'm, so, I'm just even so happy right now thinking about it still. but we should probably move on. <laughs> Unending joy. That's what Jesus wants us to have. And we have a present confidence. We have a future hope. We have this unending joy. And the basis for us to be able to live this way is because it's not in ourselves. It's not in us uh, to do this. It's not in us to develop these traits or have these characteristics but we have this because of who he is. And that's where we go next in the doxology as we move into verse 25. We have all of this, notice, because he is, and we're gonna see seven attributes of God, starting with the fact that he is only. He is only. He is the only God. And it's to him we ascribe our praise. This, this stands in sharp contrast, by the way, to what human beings have been doing throughout history. False teaching and the creating of their own gods. And very often what human beings like to do is they like to make themselves their god. This is our favorite god right here. Ourselves. Or we create reflections of the natural world. There are gods attached and, and, and uh, tied in with the sun, the seas, weather, animals, planets, and stars. Or there are spiritual beings like angels, devils, forces, energy, concepts like the yin-yang or distortions of, even, even distortions of the one true God you see in the great Abrahamic monotheistic religions of Islam, which is the distortion, or Judaism, which, which it, it, the Jews, while there's no distortion in their core teaching, they rejected their Messiah 2,000 years ago. They've not embraced the gospel. They've not seen that the prophecies pointed to Jesus Christ. And even in Christianity, the other great monotheistic Abrahamic faith there are so many distortions, thousands of distortions of the gospel out there in various teachings. We like to create our own gods. We like gods that we can see, gods that we can handle, and gods that we can fully understand ourselves. And so we make idols of all kinds. And in the 21st century rationalistic Western culture in which we live, our gods are threefold. The temples that we have built are to the gods of money, sex, and power. And we go to those temples regularly, e even as Christians. Even in the last week, some of us have stopped off at the temple of money and worship. And some of us have stopped off in the temple of sex and worship. And some of us have stopped off in the temple of power and worship. 
even as Christians. This is where our culture sets up its temples. This is where we are on a regular basis called to worship. We're called by the songs that we listen to and the movies and television shows we watch. We're called to worship in the literature and in the legislation of our governments. They pull us to these places and to these objects of worship. Jude, like all of the biblical authors throughout the scriptures, points to the one and only God, which, by the way, for Jude, was a very dangerous countercultural claim. If, if Jude wrote his letter, and we're not sure who he wrote it to, but if Jude wrote his letter to a Jewish audience, sure, that was a monotheistic culture. They believed in the one God. But at the same time, it was a very small population in the midst of a very large Roman Empire. If Jude's letter went to a more Gentile church, he was preaching right into, uh, right at the culture of the day, this very polytheistic, multiple gods, this polytheistic culture of the Roman Empire. And so he's challenging the culture of the day. And, and by the way, it's no less of a risky claim today as we navigate our own cultural context that shouts down any idea of the exclusivity of Jesus Christ. But Jesus was putting a stake in the ground when he said in John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You can't get any more exclusive than that. There's only one way to God. There's only one God. And the only way to him is Jesus Christ. The apostles, by the way, they picked up on this. This wasn't just Jesus preaching it. They started preaching it. In Acts uh, chapter 4, verse 12, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name. What's the name? There's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved saved. He is the only. And he is the only, notice this next, saving God. He's the only God, our Savior, the doxology says, a reference to the Father saving us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. It was God the Father who so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. And the point being made is that we cannot save ourselves. Man-made religion is useless most religion is useless. Morality falls short. Good deeds won't pay the price. We need a saving God. We also need a glorious God. Notice this third attribute of God. The word we saw earlier, doxa, is here again in the ascription. To him be glory. We looked at against this in some depth earlier, but, but this is the radiance of God. The glory of God is the radiance of his holiness and his perfection. As one commentator said, this is his, his moral splendor on display. And it is this that makes so many people uncomfortable and causes them to reject or reconsider the faith they once embraced. It's the demands of the Christian life. It's, it's God saying to us, and we read this in various places, but in 1 Peter 1, 16, you shall be holy for I am holy. The evidence of genuine salvation in anyone's life is, is that we're becoming more holy. We're becoming more and more like Jesus. And that's too much for those who would rather indulge in what the world offers them. So they believe distortions of the gospel. They trifle with God. They toy with the world. And it's a dangerous game. Because our God is majestic. To him be majesty. To him be greatness. To him be prominence. To him be honor. There's overlap in all of these descriptions in the doxology. Jude has been very deliberate in his word choice. He's building this concluding argument to his letter 
against false teachers, providing the Christian with confidence and a call to look at God who is the only one worthy of such recognition and praise. He is majestic. And in in the last two words, in glory and majesty, we have this one-two punch that emphasizes God's, as another commentator said, his overwhelming grandeur, his glory and his majesty which produces condemnation for false teachers and again produces confidence for those of us who love Jesus and follow him. He is the only saving, glorious, majestic, and notice this, sovereign God. To him be dominion, the doxology says. Dominion is God's absolute power over all things. God bows to none and all will eventually bow to him. In Philippians, Paul wrote, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He has dominion. He's in charge of it all. He's sovereign over everything. The disciples, you'll remember, were in the boat and Jesus was sleeping in the boat and and they set out on the Sea of Galilee and a storm whipped up and the Sea of Galilee is renowned for these incredible storms that whip down out of the mountains and onto the sea and create these life and death situations. The disciples, some of whom were very seasoned fishermen and, and knew the sea well, were terrified, believing as they took on water that this was gonna be their end and they couldn't believe, they were incredulous at the fact that Jesus was asleep in the boat. And when he was awakened, he said, peace be still, and the storm stopped. The disciples were terrified. They were terrified. What sort of man is this, they asked, that even the wind and the waves obey him? He's sovereign. He's the sovereign. He has dominion over all of these things. It's such a great, great question for us to ask. What sort of man is this that we're worshiping? Everything is under his rule. And again, imagine the confidence and hope that that gives us to understand that as we go through all kinds of things in our lives, as we look at world events, but also see the minutia of our own lives, that God is in charge should give us great confidence. This leads to a sixth attribute. And this is one we need to spend a little extra time on. God is authoritative. To him be authority, the doxology says. By implication, this is God's right to rule. God's right to rule. Since he is the creator, he stands above all things and rules by his own authority. And this is where we end up in conflict with him because it's baked into our nature. And we've been opening our services up with this um, this call to worship, you've heard, you've heard it all fall. And as part of that, we talk about those who are rebellious. We've talked about it every Sunday since we've started this ministry year in September. Because we come, some with big rebellions, but the vast majority of us are coming to church each week with very small rebellions, little things that we're just disagreeing with God about. And what it comes down to is that we're not willing to be under God's authority in those things. And so we come together as a group of rebels every Sunday to hear the word of God, to be challenged by the authority of God's word and to get ourselves aligned with who he is again. And again, this is baked into our nature. It's who we are. One of my amazing, uh, beautiful, precious grandkids has taken to using his parents' first names Uh, when he pushes against their authority. And in the moment, it's hilarious to hear him push against his mom and dad um, by calling them out. Luke, Cam, oh, sorry, I kind of revealed who it is, sorry. (laughs) It's fine. Luke gave us the most grief, and for Cheryl and I to see this happen brings such joy. (laughs) Almost at, a le- at, a, at the same level as Texas barbecue. I mean, <laughs> Cheryl and I, we watch Luke with his little son and we go into our room at night and we laugh and laugh. It's, oh, 
It's so great being a grandparent. But in the moment, again, it's funny to hear a toddler call out his parents by their names in this moment of exasperation. But of course, the challenge has to be met with gentle authority. The rebellion, however slight, needs to be addressed because sin in the heart of a two-year-old, sin is in the heart of a two-year-old as much as it's in the heart of a 59-year-old. We're all dealing with this, challenges to God's authority. And while the child battles the authority of his parents, I'm going toe-to-toe with Jesus and his word. And for many, again, with the theme that we've, we've, we've seen throughout this, this series, for many, the term deconstruction refers, refers to the abandonment of historic and biblical Christianity. And it comes down to a point of authority. In a recent podcast, Frank Turek and Alyssa Childers, um, and there are links to resources for all of this um, in the notes, but they said this in the podcast, um, deconstruction is a shift from the authority of the Bible or absolute truth to the authority of self. And it is a move from a truth quest, I want to know what God says, to a happiness quest, I want to feel good about myself, and I want myself to be at the center of all things. And the challenge is that many who are deconstructing their faith and those who have gone all the way to deconversion are doing so because they want to call their own shots. Let's just get down to it. They don't want to be under the authority of the Lord. They want little to know Jesus and much more of self. They don't want to submit to his authority as it is revealed to them in the word. But there is a hope here in that we can pursue a form of deconstruction. It's not all negative. We can pursue a form of deconstruction with gospel reconstruction in mind in order to emerge stronger in our faith, more convinced of the message of Jesus, more determined to fulfill the mission. And the building material that we need to construct or reconstruct our faith is right here in this doxology. And by submitting to the doxology, you're giving yourself to the authority of the word of God, the authority of God himself. And then we see this last attribute. He is authoritative and eternal. He is the eternal God. The basis for God's authority is that he is before all time and now and forever. His eternality is, as you can see, past, present, and future. God has always existed. Before even time existed, God was. Before the creation happened, God was there. And of course, he is now, and he will be forever. And as difficult as it is, and it is difficult for those of us who have finite minds, and that's all of us, it's hard for us to wrap our heads around that. Nevertheless, we should hear that, We should think about God's eternality and find great confidence and strength in the fact that he is not a God of our creation, but he is the God of creation. He is not a God of our creation, but he is the God of the creation. And he is therefore, and see this last, he is worthy of my devotion and praise. We started by looking at the very first word of these two verses, and now we conclude by looking at the very last word, in the whole thing. One word to close it, the perfect word, amen. So be it. Jude writes the word, so be it there. One commentator even suggested what would happen with these letters is they would arrive in a church. Jude wrote a letter and he wrote it to a church and it arrived. And and on the Lord's day, they would gather as the church and the pastor would stand at the front and he would take the scroll and open it and read it to the entire church. They would all hear it at the same time for the first time. And Jude's intention, the commentator suggested, was that as they were reading and as they came to the doxology, that they together would add their amen. They would say the word together as an affirmation to the Lord of everything that they had just heard. And in light of who God is, and in light of the pressures we face daily to abandon the faith, we will choose instead confidence hope, and joy because of who Jesus is. Amen? Amen. So we're going to respond to this. The only way really to respond to a doxology is to worship him and to praise him. And so that's why we got got started a little earlier on the preaching today. We left a little bit of extra time here at the end to have a little bit of extended time of worship. 
I'm going to pray in a moment, and we're going to respond to this message with, by lifting our voices in praise and worship to our God. So let's pray right now, and the team's going to come up and lead us. Father, uh, we are uh, so incredibly grateful to you for being the God that you are. And I'm grateful that the Spirit worked through Jude to give us these beautiful words in this doxology. Father, comfort for us by focusing on who you are. And I pray, God, that even in this time of worship, God, we would get our eyes fixed on Jesus. That we would push the horizontal world to the side. We would reaffirm what we know to be true about you and allow that to impact and change our lives. God, that we would be progressing from one degree of glory to another. And I pray, God, for everyone here with all these little rebellions we talked about, Father, anything that needs to be repented of, anything that needs to change in our lives, that we would confess that before you even now as we worship and determine our hearts to allow your grace to flow into our lives and we would understand who you are more, that we would spend more time gazing at the beauty of your holiness. And God, I pray for any who are watching right now or in the room who have not yet given their life to Christ, I pray that with the beauty of the scriptures today, they would feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit and be convinced of the truths that they've heard today and would surrender their life to Christ. Father, thank you for hearing this prayer, for being a God who is so kind to us. Receive our worship now as we sing to you in Christ's name. Amen.